I did a talk here last year called Stupid Shift in Startup Sec. And it really has kind of evolved over the uh, last 10 years of doing workshops and talking to startups and talking to people in now an increasingly large group of people uh, in government that want to talk about technology, that want to talk about why don't we have more tech here, how do we get more entrepreneurs to move here, why don't we have a big company like Google. Um, so stupid shit is usually pretty much universal. People say things that they don't really understand, but they think it's the right thing to say. And I've been in tech for a long time, and one of the early jokes was, you know, how, what's the difference between a car salesman and a tech salesman? You know, the car salesman knows when he's lying. And it, it's, it's very, very true because, you know, in, in tech, we, we, we want to believe in rainbows and unicorns. We want to believe in the promise of what we're building. We want to believe in so much that that becomes a story. And it, it really kind of transcends the product into all sorts of wonderful, you know, glass overfilling, or overflowing type scenario of what it is a technology can do for us. And it really, it just isn't honest. So when we talk about marketing, which is kind of my field, you know, marketing is about lying. But it's not about lying to the customer, it's about lying to ourselves. So, you know, in a, in a tech scenario, in a government scenario, we lie to ourselves about the value of what we're providing to the end customer. We lie about what we think, what we're creating can, can actually do, or that the idea that we have is so transformative that people should just be showering us with money and resources to actually bring it to market. We're really lying about you know, what it is that, uh, that, you know, that we understand or don't understand about the people that are actually going to be affected on the other side of the transaction, the user, the customer, the person that needs to, you know, embrace that and pay us money, or at least pay us their time, invest their time in using that. And, you know, that's when we get into this, this endless loop of lying to ourselves about what we're doing. And elevator pitches, they couldn't possibly survive a 20-story ride, much less a three-story ride, because we've got so many things wrapped up in our minds we want to tell people most of it pretty much useless. Most of it we've convinced ourselves is important about the platform we've built it on, or the language we're using, or the buzzword that we happen to be embracing. And we talk so much about that that we forget about what it is that we're actually, the problem we're actually solving. Why we created the solution. Why we're doing what we're doing. And that applies for whether it's a tech product, or it's a government program, or really anything that you're doing. And the other side of that transaction, you've got someone that has a problem that you are solving with your solution or your service. And that's really what we need to focus on. And if you do that, you stop lying to yourself. And when you stop lying to yourself, you probably will lie less to your customers and investors and coworkers and things like that. And that's a good start. So um, I apologize for the slides not working and just having to stare at a USF logo the entire time, but it is what it is. Okay. Uh, the other area. I was, I was Joyce Slide Monkey at Sarasota. <laughs> so last year, we, this is the slide that I based the entire presentation on. On the left side is everything you've done up to this point in your life, in your professional life. That's where you found the problem that you want to talk about. That's what is, is kind of led you to that aha moment of, if I have this problem, maybe other people have this problem. So on the left side of that is all your credibility, everything that you've done up to that point, every customer, every cohort, every person that you've talked to that's kind of given you the energy to say, other people have this problem, maybe I should actually create a solution because there's a market out there. The problem is we don't really talk about that side. We get so wrapped up in the other side in convincing people to like us, convincing people to have confidence in what we're doing, we forget about the credibility. Confidence is important as well, but it really is based on the credibility. It's based on who you are, what you've done. It doesn't mean you can't be, you know, uh, a high school or right out of college or 13-year-old entrepreneur that decides they fix a problem. But it's what you do with that fix. It's, it's how you actually go out there and talk to potential customers and validate that it is something that people use and or buy that helps you build that confidence on the left side of the arrow. So this year, I expanded a little bit. I actually put it in today's day. This, this is where we are today, Saturday the 28th. Everything that you can talk about, everything that you do is to the left side of that, the downslope. Everything you're doing is creating your confidence, building that up so that you can talk about what it is that you've done to solve the problem. Talk about your history in IT or in medicine or any of those different things that you've done in your life that helped you identify the problem and go and validate the market. 
Talk to other people like you. Talk to your potential customers. Talk to your market to, the, to hear that feedback. The yeses and the noes. The little failures of, no, I wouldn't buy that. I wouldn't give you a nine. Or I don't have that problem. You have that problem, but I don't have that problem. Or finding the people that do have that and really validating the market. So that's where you work on your credibility. You use that to get confirmation or validation that you actually have people out there that are like you, that want to invest in that, invest their time. Because you found something that they've dealt with, professionally or personally, that if you can solve it, they are your customer base. And that really gets you to the point of talking credibly with other people about what you're going to do. It could be potential users, potential customers, potential investors, potential co-founders. It doesn't really matter. We get so wrapped up in doing an investor pitch when most of you probably will never run into an investor. But certainly not until you've already talked to co-founders, developers, people that are going to help you along the way with that journey. People that are going to help you build the product and validate your market long before you ever get to the point where you should be talking to an investor. You're going to talk to those people first. It's the same conversation because they have to share that pain. They have to share that belief that you solved the problem. If not, you're just hiring a code monkey or a marketing person to put you on Facebook. And that's a big freaking waste of time and money because, you know, marketing people will take your check. They will take your money to do all sorts of useless things with your bad ideas. They will help you with your lives. That's not really where you want to be. You want people to believe that you've solved the problem and help you validate that they've solved the problem and then help you deliver on that problem. So we get to that point. Today, this is where you are with your solution. This is where you are with your solution. Today, the only thing that matters is everything that got you to today. The stuff on the other side does not matter. Yes, it may lead to cash, or it may lead to crap. You don't know, because really it's just speculation. Don't tell me about the customers that are over here. Don't tell me about the X percentage of the population of China that you're going to serve to then get investment money, because it's all crap. The only thing that matters is what has got you to this point today. And if you haven't done enough customer validation, if you haven't built a product and prototyped it, if you haven't talked to real users and gotten used to that good and bad, then you're not ready for anything on the other side. Because you move that ahead day by day. Tomorrow's not a five-year plan. Tomorrow's 29. It's a Sunday. Take it off. Then Monday. Then Tuesday. And that's the way it progresses. And all the different things that you do to validate your idea, to build your, you know, the people around you that also believe in that idea and are going to help you a day at a time. And that's how you should create your messaging. That's how you should talk about your company or your product or your passion, whatever it is. It can be for social good. It doesn't have to be just a product. It can be a service. It can be anything you're going to do, again, to solve a problem. So let's not get too wrapped up in telling futures because it really becomes about a crystal ball. You don't really know what's going to happen in the future. You may know what happened on that side to build credibility. You may have found the perfect customer and then gone out and found out that there's more of those customers. And that helps you build that story of confidence of who you're going to go to on the right side. Because there will be more customers of that type. If you validated who they are, what they buy, where they buy from, all the different things. Your business model is proven on the left side of that star. Not a conjecture of, well, most people in this market go through the following distribution. I don't care about most people. I care about where people buy similar products today. If you've got an IT product, there are people out there buying IT products today. Where do they buy them? Do you understand that business model? Do you understand who the distributors are in those channels? If you don't, and you're just going by what you read in Network World, you're just speculating. Because I don't care how unique your product is, there are analogies for your product. There are customers that are out there that have bought something slightly similar with the same type of budget, whether it's IT or marketing or HR or something like that. People have tread down that path before. Get to know what those products are. Get to know who those distribution partners are. Get to know the pricing that they normally charge in that market. The go-to-market, how do they get out there, what press covers them, all those different things. This is all marketing. 
Marketing is not the crap that you do on that side, on Facebook and Twitter. Marketing is what you do on this side to validate your customer. That's really where you have to invest your time. As I said, I've said it many, many times, and I said it when we were talking at SBC. Marketing is stalking. Marketing is not the fluffy stuff and lipstick on the pig that you worry about. Marketing is stalking because you have to identify your customer and know exactly what they do, how they buy stuff, what they read, what influences their decisions, what gets them to consider a new product or not, who are the early adopters of new products, or who are the people that wait until it is old and gray before they'll bring it into their organization. Get to know those people, that profile, and build your company and build your business model around that. Otherwise, you're just pulling stuff out of the air, looking at Network World or looking at CRM and going, I want to be like that. Do the homework. You've got to figure out what it is that makes them drive those buy, uh, buying decisions. Now you're talking marketing strategy. That's crazy talk. And it, is, it is crazy talk. But marketing strategy <laughs> is done one customer at a time. You've got to figure out who that person is. There's going to be a lot of people who are not your customers. Not just in the beginning, maybe never. But you need to understand those first couple of customers. I hate it when I see someone speculating about the first million dollars or the first five million dollars or what they're going to do. I care about your first customer. And then maybe the next three after that. And the trends that got those customers to buy from you. What was similar with your sixth customer that, that, that with the same characteristics of your first customer? If there's no similarities, you gotta go back to the drawing board and figure out what you know about those customers. Because if there's no similarities, you have no way of building a strategy and a business model going forward. Then you're just shotgunning to the world and hoping for the best and spending a boatload of money to do so. You have to find people that are like the people you're going to be selling to. When I gave this talk last year, there was a guy standing in the back with glasses and a black t-shirt. I used him as my example. The guy with the black t-shirt and the glasses, if he's my first customer, I want to go validate that that is my target customer. Not going to go crazy ass off and looking at people in red t-shirts and white t-shirts, people without glasses, just hoping for the best. I'm going to make sure that I can validate the guy with the black t-shirt and glasses first. After I do enough of that, maybe I'll stray a little bit to people in black t-shirts with contact hunters. But I'm not going to go crazy because they're not really going to figure out who my good target customer is. Trends repeat themselves, especially when you've got uh, tech products. People repeat their buying behavior. Consumers are a little bit crazy sometimes, but in general, people follow the same procedure. So, he's the rule breaker. Just who do you want listening? It's almost the last session. Who do you want listening? And then earlier, I talked about this. You're going to build that message, and it's going to be the same message no matter who's out there. It's the co-founders, it's the people that you want to try the messaging out on, and if you strike a chord with them, they may become supporters of building that prototype or building that product or helping you take the market. And that's really what you want to do is to you know, try this message out enough on the people that are going to be your resources going forward. And we always talk about finding co-founders in the Tampa Bay area and how incredibly tough it is. Maybe we're going about it the wrong way. We're trying to push products down people's throats, or we're trying to promise this or that. Really, you know, get out there and talk about problems. Don't talk about your product. I mean, bar camp, we're not supposed to talk about products at all. But really, when you go out there with potential customers, don't talk about products either. Don't, don't make them feel like they're potentially going to buying something. Talk about the problem space. Talk about what it is that they experience in their life that you can potentially solve with this problem. And that way, you're going to get more honest feedback. I've dealt with a number of founders that say, well, Steve Jobs never talked to a customer, he never, he never dealt with any feedback. He just knew what he wanted to do. Um, a, I don't believe that. But B, you're not Steve Jobs, so let go of that idea. <laughs> you need to get out there, and you need to engage people around the problem. It's the only way to get honest feedback. It's the only way to get people to let their guard down and talk about solving problems that you can then transition to maybe discussing Products or discussing, you know, what, you know, how might we go about doing, uh, you know, solving that, or what other products you buy that you've tried to apply to that problem that may or may not have worked. This is the way you get that market information. That's the way you get the intelligence to really figure out what your go-to-market model is going to be. 
But again, if all you do is go out there and sell, 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 people's guard is going to be up. And in the early stages when you haven't even built the prototype, selling is not the right thing to do. Because God forbid someone says, well, yeah, well, where is it? Well, now you've got them thinking about buying a solution and you don't have it. So take your time. Patience is the one thing you really want to have when you're doing marketing because you want to do it slowly. You're not going to just magically go in there, do a focus group or meet one-on-one -on -one with someone and have them say, well, absolutely, and then just throw the check. You don't want that to happen because that really hasn't helped you out in, in your journey of getting the right market information. So what do they want to hear? And to, again, getting back to the line about what we think is cool. People want to hear about the problem space. People want to talk about why you built this thing. They want to talk a little bit about what you built, so they get an idea of what is it. Is it a software product? Is it a hardware product? Is it a floor of wax? Is it a dessert topping? You know, what is it? But I really don't care how you built it. I mean, we as technical people are always into the bits and the bytes. We're always into how the widget works. That's not really the way you want to approach the conversation. Because you want to get people nodding that there is a problem. You want to get people buying into the fact that you are there to talk about that problem and not sell them something. And really feel that you, you know, like that they're, you're both invested in solving that problem before you worry about how you did it. And way too often we see pitches and business plans and you know, all sorts of things that spend way too much time on how you built it. I've read so many business plans that look more like white papers or architectures, convincing people that this is the most complex thing in the world, and I'm going to educate you until you believe. It's not the way to approach it. People just want to hear about the problem. People want to hear that you have empathy for that problem and maybe have figured out a way to do it. The how you built it, you can get into for that segment of the customer that, you, that, take, that goes that, that down the path with you. But you really want to focus as little on technology and as little on how you built it as possible. Again, business plans that spend the first 10 pages convincing me that the freemium model is the way to go and they've never talked about their product, not a good strategy. The buzzwords are killing us, and but we put in way too many of them. So that falls into three categories. And this is mainly on the right side of the star, the, 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 the future side of today. What we populate our discussions with, our business plans, our elevator pitches, they're either boring, they're buzzwords, or they're both. And think about that. Think about your own pitches. Think about your own presentations. And how much of it is gobbled up or uh, jumped up with all sorts of things that you thought that people wanted to hear? This is the SaaS model, or we're building a mobile app, or we're building an app, app, app. And you know, rainbows and, rainbows and unicorns, I'm building mobile, so it's got to be good. You haven't solved any problems. You haven't really addressed what it is that we're talking about here. You basically are just trying to dazzle them with the fact that you know the, the, the most recent stuff. So stay away from those business terms or technical terms that add absolutely no value to the presentation, and absolutely no value to your discussion, and really just make you look stupid. Make you look naive when you're talking to someone who doesn't really care. I mean, you'll get a lot of good cheerleading. And Joy talked about that in her presentation. We've had a couple of other people like, we don't need cheerleading. We don't need the pat on the back saying, you're doing a great job. That doesn't help build your product. That doesn't help build your company. You want people to be critical. No, I know Justin has no problem with this. <laughs> um, and, and, and that's exactly the type of feedback you want. That's a really good home page, but I wouldn't have done that that way. You want a little kick in the butt on everything you do, on every interaction you have with potential customers. You didn't get it perfect, and you want to hear that. If you hear that you got it perfect, they're lying to you this time. Because oh, that line. Huh? Oh, flying, flying pigs. <laughs> All right. Um, so just don't, and only talk to people who are going to give you that honest feedback. If you end up with a lot of cheerleading, you're talking the wrong crowd. You're not hanging out with people that are good at critical thinking, that are going to give you the type of feedback that you need to improve your pitch, to improve your product, to improve your company. Find the people that are going to kick your butt every once in a while. Talk to Justin. Um, but. Don't seek out people that are just going to be the cocktail crowd. 
they're going to say, oh, that's interesting. Ooh, a mobile app. Ooh, that's very, very good. We, we need more of that. It's, it's not helpful to what you're doing. And then this is kind of, I'll throw back the laugh here, the who cares. A lot, a lot of the different things that I see in presentations, and I, I'm just amazed that I still hear them. Uh, we're pre-IPO. Well, I guarantee pretty much everyone in this room is pre-IPO. <laughs> um, it, it's, it, it's not a great value add to your presentation. I'm not sure why it's there. Um, you know, patent pending, don't care. Again, there are certain things you want to talk about when you're having those first engagements with potential customers or potential, you know, problem cohorts. And your patent is not on their mind. It really doesn't matter. It probably has very little value. And I still talk to people who spend $10,000 on provisional patents or engaging an attorney when they really don't understand what they have. But they think that getting that as a marketing term is so important that gives them credibility in the marketplace that they will spend 10 grand out of their own pocket when they haven't spent 10 grand on building the product yet. That's just wrong. There's a time and place for patents. There's a time to invest in them. There's a time to talk to patent attorneys. And there's a time to stay the hell away from patent attorneys because they will just drag you down and slow down your progress. So I'm not saying don't pursue it, but don't spend all your money on it. And don't think that it is the marketing buzzword that is going to get you credibility in the marketplace, because it's not. It really is just a very, very expensive piece of ink on paper that people aren't going to care about until you've proven a lot of other things. And then, whether or not you've got something patentable or a trade secret that you can protect or other intellectual property becomes a consideration down the road. But you have to win over my heart and mind a lot more before I care about your patents. You've solved the problem. You've identified a market. You're really going down that path of building something that customers are responding positively to. And then if it is protectable under a patent, then it might be something interesting to talk about. But I, I hear it way, way too often, and I feel bad for the people that spend the money because they're never ever going to get it back. And if the patents are not one and done, patent is a strategy where you've got to surround your entire technology area and protect it. Because all you're going to do is invite someone to come in that has more money and more lawyers and all those different things. So your patent is not $10,000 to get it. It's $500,000 to protect it. So from that perspective, you still want to go get it? Is it the right thing to do? Or should you build a product, build a customer base, and then figure out if you've actually got something that can scale the market? Um, Nonprofit. I don't know why that's in any presentation, but I see it increasingly. I'm a 501c whatever. I, I don't care. Again, you're, you're pulling at my heartstrings to prove that you're a nonprofit and you're a wonderful person. Have you solved the problem? Because if it's the right problem that fits a nonprofit, I'll ask you that question later. Or you can use that as the, you know, to cap things off when you're talking about the overall structure. But solve the problem first. Don't tell me you're a nonprofit anything. Because now you just kind of, I zoned out. Because now you've made me believe that you really don't care about building something scalable or profitable or important. But you think that because it's a 501c3, you can slack by by not building something very interesting. Well, it's a nonprofit, or we're going to give it away. I don't care. That really doesn't help me. Solve my problem. Solve a problem for anyone. And then your cor corporate structure is somewhere later. If you're doing a nonprofit, that's great. Don't tell me up front. Tell me about the problem. Uh, you need technology? No, you don't. Probably not. Uh, you know, and, and that's not enough of a differentiator, differentiator to really grab my attention. Don't jumble in all these buzzwords of how you're disruptive and how no one else has done this, or I don't have any competition, so this must be a great, big, great place to be. I want to see someone with competition, or I want to see someone that actually recognizes they have competition that they've engaged with the right people in the marketplace to run into those people and understand them. I, I don't know where I heard it, but just in the last week, it's like in an investor presentation, if, uh, if they're, they're asked the question, they say, well, yes, there are competitors, but we really don't run into them. Uh, that, that's not a good answer. That means you really are not connected with the marketplace and you're not talking to the right people or you're not asking the right questions. It's not that you have to be head-to-head, feature-to-feature with all these different people. 
But again, don't say stupid shit that says to your audience or your investor that I really don't understand my market. Because all it says is, well, it may be interesting, you've got more homework to do, so go away for a while. And what you're trying to do is engage people in conversation to ask questions. These type of things make people go away because they believe that you're not ready or you haven't asked the right questions or you haven't engaged with the right people. And that's not the goal. Even if you don't have a product to sell today, you want people to be engaged in the conversation. You want to ask them questions that they respond to after they think. And that's not the type of question we normally ask. We ask yes, no questions. We ask happy questions. We ask questions that encourage cheerleading as opposed to honest analytical feedback. And when we get cheerleading, we say more stupid shit. So, rule number one, remember, whatever you pitch, I guarantee you are far more excited about it than the person on the other end of that conversation. So you better make whatever you're going to say count. You better make it something they can empathize with. You better make it a problem that they have. And if they're not in that market, they're not in that problem space, it doesn't mean you don't talk to them, but don't drone on about what you're doing. Make your point and move on. Yeah? What was BC on your previous slide? There What's that? Something written like, until I get BC, I don't know what. Oh, yeah. Um, venture capital. Venture capital, OK. Yeah, I can't do anything until I get a BC to back. Uh, no, no, because I mean, you're just not going to, especially with that attitude, you're not going to be a BC or one who's going to be honest about it. Um, you know, you, you've got to build your product. And I've said that for way too many years now. Whatever you're thinking about, stop thinking and start building. I don't care what it is, whether you go to Radio Shack, whether you learn a little bit of coding, you go to Home Depot, Michael's Art Supply, there's some place you can go to start building your product today. Toothpicks and Elmer's Glue, doesn't matter. Start building something that you can show to someone. Start building a representation of what's in your head. Start drawing some type of representation if it's a, a, a software product or a, a, a web service. You can mock something up. Anybody can mock something up. My six-year-old can mock something up because she's got enough brands. It, you can too. Because you have to have something that you can present to someone to convey the idea. They may not like the idea, but until you convey it in a form that they can look at, think a little bit about, and give you some honest feedback, then you're just, you're just trading buzzwords. You're not really accomplishing anything. If you're out to network and just meet people and have a great time, stick with that strategy. But if you actually want feedback that's going to give you the, the, the critical analysis of what you think you might want to build, you better have some representation. I don't care what it is. Piece of paper. We've talked about minimal, minimum viable product. Minimum viable product is whatever you have in your hand. It can be a sketch. It can be toothpicks. It can be anything that get people to focus and really consider what it is you're asking them. Anything tangible is better than rainbows and unicorns because you're never going to get a good grounded answer when you're asking people to conceptualize along with you. You're taking them on that stinky poo journey that has no grounding and, and you know, just, it's all conceptual. And they're either going to say, I don't get it, or that's wonderful, and go away. And you really haven't accomplished anything. Um, so if I hit all my points on that, good enough. Oh, and, and of course my favorite, I only need to capture X percent of the target market to be the next billion dollar company. Now that you've been in this room, if I ever hear any of you say that in public, you've got it coming. So, yeah, you, I, I have a yardstick out there, and I'm not afraid to use it. Um, rule number two, apathy wins. Don't ever think that people have to do anything. They don't, because they don't have to buy anything. They don't have to use anything. The bulk of the, of the, of the public is just happy doing what they're doing right now. Unless you really find someone in that problem space, personal or professional, that is just like you, and then runs across that same problem, especially in the early adopter phase, then again, you're gonna get cheerleading, a pat on the back, but generally people are gonna go, eh, it doesn't really matter, or it doesn't matter to me, or it doesn't matter right now. So your number one competitor, I don't care what market you're in, is apathy. And apathy will always kick your butt, especially if you do say a lot of the words that are up there. People are going to go, I'm confused. I'm not sure what that person is saying. So I choose to do nothing. And that wins almost every time, especially in the early stage. 
you'll get that you know, couple of people that will take a bet on you, that will risk what they're doing, some of their time, maybe some of their money, and try a beta product or try a prototype. They're a fraction of a fraction of a fraction of a percent. Most people would just rather do nothing, and that's okay. So the answer is choose simplicity. Whatever you're doing, building a business model, if you're doing the math, doing the financials on your, pro on your, uh, on your company, whatever you do with the messaging, keep it simple. Don't gum it up with a lot of different things. Don't tell people what you think they want to hear. Really focus on the problem space. Keep the message as simple as possible. And if you find yourself making it too complex, again, you're back to lying. To yourself, and then on to other people. Don't do that. Business plans are the worst thing in the world. Uh, startup founders, number one enemy is Microsoft Word. Because it lets us be creative writers. Don't! Don't do it. You don't want to go down that path. Simple. Simple presentation, simple math, simple business model. I get from here to here to here to get to my customer. It's real simple. If you don't understand, because it's a point over here, a little cloud where something magical happens, and out the other end spits cash, you don't really understand how your customer buys things. Go find that analogous product to what they're buying today that's in your space. If it's enterprise software, I guarantee you can find someone who's buying enterprise software today. If it's a consumer product, I guarantee there's someone out there that you can go out there and model your business after that. Doesn't mean you're gonna absolutely copy everything that they do, but you're gonna understand how the messaging, how the money, and how the influence flows. You do that, you now understand your market. And when you're talking to someone, that's what populates the left side of the slide. That's what's over there in your experience and your confidence. People will always, especially other entrepreneurs, other founders, potential co-founders, and especially investors, if you sit down and tell them something about, about a market that they didn't know, and you're talking about real customers with real problems, almost anybody will listen to that. They may not give you cash, they may not come work for you, but they'll understand you're being sincere. And they'll understand that you're looking at a problem and figuring out a way to solve it. No one walks away from a conversation like that. But you make it complex, and you talk about all sorts of moving parts, and you throw in lots of buzzwords. I can't wait to get out of that conversation. And you'll see that whether it's one-on-one -on -one here, or at a trade show, or anything else. So keep it simple, um, and everything else pretty much falls in line. You'll have a much better time talking to other people. You'll find <coughs> other people in the community that you'll want to bond with, that will help you build your next product, and you may, or you may want to help them build their back to the next product. Joy talked about this in her presentation. Honesty and integrity matter. And that's really what's behind you having good, clean messaging about what you're doing and who you are, which is what Joy's presentation was all about. Who are you? Which is also the left side of that slide. You can make shit up, but that conversation is not going to last very long. And I'm certainly not going to give you the time of day to talk about your product after you've told me a fairy tale about who you are. So figure out the things you've done in your life, professionally or personally, that have helped you build that story underneath the product or the company that you're trying to build. And use that as a cornerstone of what you're doing. That is your credibility for solving your problem. That is your credibility for having that conversation. That's your credibility to ask this guy over here, do you want to come work with me on this? Do you want to meet me for coffee and talk about some of these problems? People don't say no to things like that. It's sincere. It's peer-to-peer. -peer. It's giving back to the community, which is why we do our you know, So that you have an opportunity to do these type of things. So don't be this guy. We've got plenty. Florida, it, this is a poster child for Florida. Now, we, we just don't want that to really be our image, especially in tech. And it doesn't need to be. And really, at the grassroots level, it isn't. But above the grassroots level, especially as we get closer and closer to politics, it is this guy. Um, and that's not really what we want to do with each other as peers, is to have this type of image. We want to be people helping other people solve problems and build great products. So that's it for this year. That's enough stupid shit for one day. Um, so questions, comments, discussion. I, I wanted to go a little bit shorter than this, but uh, we have flying things. Some, yeah. some, uh, some ideas or business models aren't simple. Uh, you can simplify them based on the audience. 
you have to. Because he, it just makes it that much more difficult to go find somebody to talk about, to build, to take it to market. I believe everything can be simplified based on the audience. Remember, not every audience is going to be your customer, so you better find out a simple, uh, simple way of, of discussing your business model. Because not everyone's going to want to sit through that. Well, let's say it was a venture capitalist that was going to spend millions. Should they be willing to explore something slightly more complicated? Yeah, but you've got to get to that stage. Pitch? That, but that, that, but what, that's, a, that's a much longer discussion. You better approach them with the simple and the understandable and the not complex before you get into the complex. If they're interested enough, they'll ask. But if you've been bright, shiny object over here, they're going to go, eh, something's wrong about this. And again, analogies are a great way to describe a complex system that people that that, that, that is a path that people have been down before. But I don't. I personally don't believe anything is so complex that you can't explain it. If it is, they're not going to understand it anyway. Yeah, you got to remember, VC <laughs> better be really comfortable with that space. That, that I mean, if you're asking them to invest in a certain space, you got to get the guy that invests in that space. You're not going to educate the guy that doesn't invest in that space to go along this path with you to the point where you have educated them to the point of comfort. It ain't going to happen. They invest in their comfort zone. And so that may be a smaller audience of PE guys and venture capital guys, but you know, even there, you know, it can't be all rainbows and unicorns and you know, trust me, this is, you know, this is uh, this is magic. Simplify it. They'll ask the questions if you if you get them hooked on a good idea and they've actually solved the problem. But the best investor presentation I ever sat at was a women's investing group in Seattle called Sarah Capital. And the guy that was going on just before me got to the point of his presentation, and one of the uh, lunch attendees said, can you explain your revenue model? And he said, well, that's kind of complex. His life, his company, his presentation ended at that moment. It ain't complex. Even if it is complex, it ain't complex. You've got to say, you've got to simplify. You have to. And then, let people ask questions with more depth. That comes later. I mean, you're not, you probably will never have a VC uh, meeting that's one and done. You'll meet someone, you'll start to build a relationship, you'll give them some milestones, six months, nine months, 12 months from then, they'll check back with you, you'll check in with them. How you doing? How you working on these? Are you making these milestones? Are you getting those customers? Or where are you in the revenue targets? Where's the product built? All those different things. You build that over time. Yeah. Um, when I <clears throat> embark on something, I normally there's this li the library here is, is one of the patent repositories, and they're online to the Jefferson Building. So like when, once I've done a needs assessment, and I think I'm working towards a solution, I mean I won't deal with an attorney because the attorney doesn't really have an insight into the process well enough. Mm -hmm. But I'll go to a, a patent repository and then go through the classifications around the space. And what I've found is that it, it provides me, I mean, it provides me a history of what intellectual property is in the space. Mm -hmm. And then it also provides like an insight as to the ways that other people have solved it. Right. And so it informs, you know, the whole kind of problem analysis thing. But I don't spend the money on on an attorney, and again, until it's clear that you can create a minimum viable product. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, it doesn't mean you can't talk to an attorney, but I wouldn't make that the tip of the spear of your strategy. Oh, no. yes. Build the product. Yeah. Get a customer. Yeah. What do you think that the city of Tampa is doing right as far as encouraging startups to stay here instead of going out west or up to the northeast? The city or the county or our region? So I like to talk regionally, even though there's lots of political lines that you're crossing there. So let's just talk regionally. Um, there are resources that are starting to come to bear, you know, this being one of the examples of getting Hillsborough County to pitch in and help sponsor this. Um, but the conversation is trying to change. So we've got the EDI2 program in Hillsborough County, which is a relatively small amount of money, $2 million spread over two to three years. Um, it's really 
the conversation that's changing. Uh, technology is something that comes out of the USF. Because that was the answer. When you were talking to economic developer, talking to any politician, you'd say, innovation? Oh yeah, we've got USF. So it's changed the conversation to the point where people are not just saying, we've got a school and someday it'll be Stanford. Because that's pretty much the track we were on. Now we talk about all sorts of grassroots things. We talk about, we even have county people, city people, even economic development people talking about our camp. They don't like us, they don't understand us, but they talk about it because they've been forced to talk about it. So we're, we broaden the portfolio a little bit to say it's not just about a big company. It's just not just about moving Draper or SRI here. It's not just about, uh, you know, if you ask any, then take this test if you have a chance to be either a politician or a, uh, a journalist. Ask what our top tech companies are. The answers are still wrong. Jable? No. They're a good company. Glad to have those jobs here. But they just build stuff that other people dreamed up. They build great products to help them build products, but it still is an idea generated someplace else. Does that make us a better tech hub? Not so much. Um, tech data? No. They just move stuff around. I mean, they're, they're a logistics firm. They're not a tech firm. They don't create anything. So we've got this idea of what tech has been, and we're kind of changing that to what tech can be, which is us building products here. Us having the talent here, whether it's a two-person company or a ten-person company, someone building something that you can then ship to the globe. It's not about building a product here and selling it to Pinellas County or selling it to a local drive from here. It's, it's not about that. We're in a global market. People are starting to recognize that, but the scale of how they look at things is, is very slowly coming down to our level. When I first got here, I went to an SBDC meeting. You know what a small company was to the SBDC or to the state? Less than 500 people, a small company. That's how we classify it. Not how I classify it. I can have a really big startup of 10 people. Take an ass and take in names. But because the metrics we look at is based on W-2 jobs, not even 1099 jobs or freelance, because if you're a freelancer or a 1099 person, you don't count from an economic development model. You are not measured. They have no way or no interest in measuring you. But in Florida, you're probably 50% of the tech workforce. So are we an economic contributor? I think so. Conversations started to change. Sometimes they screwed up a little bit. Sometimes they look at tech and go, oh, if I just put the words tech, innovation, disruptive, and startup in my presentation, I'm being innovative. All I, all I really want to do is build another big, big, big building someplace and call it a tech something. But if I put startup in the, in the, in the PowerPoint that pitch, um, I've changed to it for what we are. Not so much. It's a, it's a slow process. I tell you, the last five years have come a long way. Mayor Buckhorn gets out there and he talks tech. He talks about his two girls that are in school right now and the fact that he doesn't want to lose them to another city when they graduate from college or he doesn't want them coming back there and working in a call center. He's been very blunt about that. And I applaud him for doing that. Mark Sharp is another one. A couple of other people, people in Pinellas County, people in Pasco, people in Polk, they're talking about it. Do they understand it? Eh, not quite. But they're starting to at least look at the conversation, why don't we have more tech? They still think it, it involves moving a company here from Boston in the middle of winter because we have sun. So they're not really in tune with what the tech company needs to look like or how we measure it, but we're getting there. I know that was a long answer, but you got me off on political rant, so sorry about that. You had the next question right there, and Sarah's next. Do you have like a formula or approach to simplifying complex Work, work your way out from the problem, not in from the technology. So if you start with the problem and how you're solving it, you're probably going to stick with terms that have to, that are sincere terms about how you're solving the problem. And you're, you might, you know, be, and that may add, uh, bring, make you bring in a good analogy about other products that have solved similar problems in that same space. So, you know, if it's an IT product, you talk about and you're talking about some way of instrumenting something or doing systems management, there's tons of systems management products that have been out there. You can say it's an analogous to this systems management product, but we're doing it for this space, or we're doing it for data analytics, or we're doing it for, um, you know, uh, you know so virtual, virtual machines. 
And there's all sorts of ways of finding that, uh, that analogous product and making people feel more comfortable that they're not being a pioneer in this. And no one wants to feel like guy number one. People want to feel like other people have purchased products, other uh, solutions have been out in this space. Nobody wants to be the first guy, not keep their job. So find those analogies, and that's the best way of simplifying the discussion. I liked your, uh, what are the top 10 tech companies? Uh, I was just curious if you had like a personal opinion on what, what are some of the top, your personal top 10, or, or what are some companies in the area that you think are doing things right? Um, fair warning. I mean, you couldn't find a better example. I wish I could find more examples, but you couldn't find a better example than Kurt Your Mom. Your morning's a great example. Mine's is a great example. They've built multiple companies before. Yep. The person who's asked the questions in the back of the room wants track is another great example. We could give you probably 30 if you want to have that conversation yep. just not the people that people really know. I'm sorry, what was that last bit you said? I said it's probably just not the people most people think of. Right. They think of manufacturing and distribution and service side versus right. people who actually build products. Yeah. yeah. But if people, it, you know, it's not all repeat entrepreneurs, but certainly the ones that are on second, third, fourth companies and have built big enterprise things and sold big enterprise things, you know, those are certainly the ones that are on the top of my list and Joy has a bigger list than I do, so. Do you think the region needs to become known for something? Like have a, you know, health care or something like that? I, I think if the region is going to be known, it's going to be done organically. The idea of picking yeah. a target industry. It's a dumb question. No. It's one I hear a lot. I'm just, I don't speak <laughs> I don't want politicians picking my industries any more than I want them picking my stocks. Who is going to make that decision? That's my problem. It's not that we shouldn't have target industries. Who is going to make the decision? Target industry implies that you're going to pick something up and move it and transplant it here. That's the implication from the government and economic development side, is that we're going to focus exclusively on this and we're going to pick things up and bring them and populate them. Well, I, meant, I was thinking more along the lines of, you know, there are certain resources we have here that are, that are concentrated here, build for those. Well, not just to build for those, but have those evolve, so have them build the momentum. Right. And that's a good strategy. Okay. Yeah, if we start with this is already here and can scale or is growing or yeah. we have the talent for that, my time is up, but we can take this conversation out. Then I agree. Those are good, but again, they organically flourish to the point where you can go, oh, we're a hub for that. Right. As opposed to saying, we're going to build lots of buildings and populate it with this type of company or this type of industry, right. which is the way economic development works. Right. So do we have any other questions we can take out in the hall? If not, thank you.